new tonight. One man has gone from jail to the gym. Kip Lester spent six years in federal prison for drug trafficking. But as reporter Tyler Segerman will show you, he's now working to help others. <laughs> Many people jump at the opportunity for a second chance. And that for Lester, that happened here at Extra Dawn Health and Fitness and Club. And that changed his life. Good job. 25 seconds left. A year ago today, 30-year-old Kip Luster didn't spend his time here, but inside here. He looked up for me, looked up to me for being a drug dealer. In 2013, he was arrested for possessing an intent to deliver cocaine after running from deputies in Beaumont. That led me to the dead end road. Two years later, a jury sentenced him to 20 years in prison. While I was incarcerated, I adopted some good habits as far as like dieting, exercising, and I developed a relationship with the Lord. That new lifestyle earned him an early release. Lester wanted to turn his newfound fitness hobby into a career, but after so many years behind bars, it wasn't that easy. I got discouraged because I went around to all the gyms in Beaumont and I was denied. In June of 2019, his luck finally took a turn. Travis Duggar, the owner of Exigen Health and Fitness Club, saw Lester working out with his fiance. At first, he thought he was training her, which is against gym rules. He was very apologetic. He was like, oh, you know, I'm certified. I didn't, didn't know that. The two continued to talk, and Lester was eventually hired on as a personal trainer. I'm in. <laughs> Within months, Lester got promoted to fitness director. You got it. Duggar says he works in ministry with the Jefferson County Prison, so offering Luster a second chance felt like the right thing to do. It's just awesome to be able to watch him grow more spiritually, physically, mentally. It's a workout, but Luster tells me his new life doesn't feel anything like a job. And I help him not only with their fitness goals, with their problems in life too, because I've been through a lot. Duggar says his unselfishness and personality has gained Luster a lot of support. Are y'all good? These members and these employees get behind him 110% because they don't want to see him end up back in prison. For Luster, he wants his second chance to serve as a reminder for others. It gives me a platform to show people there is another way. You can change your life. It's possible. Keep going. 35 seconds left. You got it. Finish strong. Luster's story has gained national attention, appearing in Forbes. Now he says the next thing to work out, marrying his fiance, which he plans to do in the near future. Live in Nederland, Tyler Segerman, 12 News. What's up, everybody? Big Herc 916, getting down with Fresh Out. You know how we do it over here. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, represent. Subscribe to the website, support. That way you guys can stay in the loop. I got a very special guest with me here today. I got my man, Kip from the streets to fitness, doing his thing out here. We were fortunate enough to hook up. He is out here from Florida. Man, I'm out here in LA. And uh, man, we about to make it happen with this interview. So uh, Kip, man, tell our audience a little bit about like where you from, how you grew up and you know, what led you on your, your, your path. I was born in Washington, DC. However, I was raised in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. My mom, she graduated Georgetown University. Shortly after she graduated, she died in 1990. I was one years old. And my dad, he's been in prison since I was one as well. So I was raised by my great aunt. A drug infested neighborhood is just Jack boys, D boys, and, and drug users, right? So my great aunt that raised me, she was an alcoholic, she was a gambler. So at a young age, I realized, okay, I'm gonna have to provide for myself because she can barely provide for me, right? Mm. So she couldn't afford school clothes, school shoes, up to about when I was 12, right? Her alcoholism and, and gambling habit was super bad. They called her the lotto lady, right? She would, she would get money for me from my white side of my family, right? And not spend it on me. So it was like, I was put in a situation, I was a financial pawn and my black side of my family wouldn't allow me to go live with my white side of my family. They were much mm -hmm. more well off, right? So my dad kind of used me as a financial pun to do his time, having my great aunt send him mm -hmm. money. He knew if he gave me up, then um, he wouldn't be getting that money while he was doing his time, right? So I was like 12 years old, I was into sports. I was playing basketball, played basketball in middle school and high school. And I remember one time we went to JC, JC Penney's and Sears to buy me school clothes and the car was declined, right? And I, it was like summertime, it was about to be school time. Car declined, she had no money. So I went on the block, I told my homies, I'm like, man, look, I'm about to start trapping. 
And I'm like 12 at the time. They're like, man, you tripping, you tripping. And I shot out the, the, um, the street light. So I start short stopping on the street over from where all the dope fiends go to. But I knew they'd come through here, the ones that were scared to go down the main road, right? So I shot out the light and I start running up to cars. I'm like, hey, what you want? And I tell them to spin a block. They said 200. I say, spin a block, I'm gonna go get it real quick. And first time I did, I, sh I sold some sheetrock. Boom, got the 200. And then I went and bought an eight ball. Bought an eight ball and I sold it, right? When I sold it, I went to TJ Maxx, bought myself some clothes, went to Hibbets, bought myself some shoes. I was broke and I stopped. So now I had school clothes, school shoes. And, um, but I changed the prices in the TJ Maxx. I made everything because I didn't have much money. I probably had like, I made like $300. So I changed the prices. I put the shorts tag on the shorts that cost like $4.99, but the shorts really cost like $50. And I made it $4.99. And so I got like probably like 10, 15 outfits for like $150. And fast forward, I'm 14. Now I'm full fledged. I'm trapping full time now. It happened again when I was going to ninth grade. Car declined. She couldn't buy me shoes and clothes. I'm like, okay, that's what I'm doing, right? But 13, I was dabbling a little bit, but I wasn't doing it full time. 14, full time. I gave up on sports. I stopped playing sports. I played basketball, high school, Chattahoochee High School, and I just became so discouraged. You know what I mean? Like when you're in high school, they'll bully you about the clothes that you got on and, and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, I'm about to just full time trap. So now it got to a point that where guys didn't want to serve me on the block in my neighborhood, right? And my uncle, my dad's brother, he was a crackhead, but he was like respected. You know what I mean? They got different OGs in the hood that smoke that people respect and some people don't respect, right? So my uncle started putting me on game he was like, nephew, you need a commodity that the dealers want, and then they'll deal with you. So I'm like, okay. They like the end dash. They like the car stereo stuff. So I end up finessing, going to get car stereo stuff, and I'm coming out there. Now they all running to me. So I'm like, nah, I want straight drop. I don't want the water. I learned the, the difference between the different drugs, you know what I mean? Because they would try to finesse as well. They'd give me some water now, dope. And then the the my clientele, like, nah, youngster, I'm not coming back. So that's when I start having the, the mindset of an entrepreneur. Okay, I gotta build my clientele if I really wanna start making money, right? So I, I'm smoking weed a little bit, and I'm like, man, I don't like smoking weed. I wanna make money. Stop smoking weed. So my homeboys that was hanging around me just to smoke for free, they kinda like faded away. And all my, I didn't care about being seen on the block running to cars, right? And all my homeboys, they were afraid that their parents were gonna find out. I didn't care, my great aunt, she wasn't taking care of me. So it was like, okay, I got, I'm in survival mode. And they wouldn't allow me to go live with my, my mom's side of my family. So one summer, before I said, okay, I'm gonna go full-fledged, I'm trapping full-time. I was in Chicago with my aunt, and I'm like, hey aunt, I wanna live with you. Because it was, it was night and day. Like when I went up there, I'm like, man, she lived in a nice neighborhood and fed me all the time. I ate like four times when I was there. I barely ate at my great aunt's house. You know what I mean? I probably ate one meal and then some cereal or some Roman noodles or something, right? And I said, can I please come live with you? I was playing basketball all the time. She was like, yeah, if your great aunt says yes, call my great aunt, she said no. So I already had my mind made up. When I get back to Florida, I'm trapping. I'm not playing sports no more. I just gave up on the dreams of being an athlete, right? So by the time I was 16, I'm selling everything I get, get my hands on. Crack, Coke, uh, uh, Laura Tabs, Xanax, weed, and I'm in high school. And I remember I'm trapping in high school and the CEO, the officer in high school was starting to get on my trail. So I end up not taking the weed. I used to hide it in my drawers. Then I stopped, I stopped doing that because they start bringing the dogs. You know how they bring mm -hmm. them by the lockers? Mm -hmm. So I'm hiding it in the roof, in the bathroom. And I would text people and tell them, I was serving a whole football team <laughs> and I'm selling them Purple Haze. I had the high grade, I had a connection with the Purple Haze. So one day I'm in the bathroom. I had like two ounces in the roof, right? And I had it wrapped up so it couldn't smell it, right? So I had a guy meet me in there, and when I, while I'm in there going in the roof, the janitor caught me. So I snatched it all out, and I ran. I just left the school. They had me on camera. So the next day, 
they called me to the office and it was Coach Arthur. He was the principal. He drug tested his son. His son had THC in the system. So he was like, look, I know you supply my son. Nobody told me, but I caught you on camera. My janitor caught you. I'm going to give you an ultimatum. You either, I'm going to expel you when I catch you, or you withdraw out of school yourself. Automatically in my head, I'm like, man, I'm tired of going to school anyways, right? So I'm like, okay, cool. We're going to withdraw. I withdraw. So I went home. I told my great aunt, like, look, they're going to kick me out of school, and I'm going to be expelled. I might as well withdraw. So I wanted to go to school in my hood so I could trap on the block all night. The school right here, the alternative school, and the block right on the corner. So this around the time Jeezy had five in the morning on the corner clocking. So he really inspired me, like, to trap or die for real. You know what I mean? Oh, so Jeezy, uh, uh, Yo Gotti, and T.I., they pushing trap music. So, and I wanted money. I wanted cars. I wanted all the materialistic things that I was deprived. I ain't going to say deprived from because people that's well off, they just had structure. You know what I mean? I didn't have mom. I didn't have dad. I didn't have nice clothes. So I started off with the dream of getting nice clothes. And then I got addicted to fast money. You know what I mean? So now I'm 16. I'm going to this alternative school. So I remember it was a white girl. She wanted like 100 lower tabs. And she was setting me up. So I'm like, 100? All right, I'm going to bring them to school for you. So I get to school. And I felt something funny, right? So I'm going to school. I'm leaving. I got a trap phone. I mean, it's booming like every 10, 20 minutes, a play calling. So while I'm in school, this play is calling. I'm going to the bathroom. I ask the teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And I tell somebody to go meet my people that's coming on the next street to the school, right? And so the girl was moving funny. I'm like, where's the money? She's like, oh, my parents forgot to give me the money. I didn't get my allowance. So I'm like, man, I'm sitting in the class. I, I got this feeling that she's going to set me up. So I asked to go to the bathroom again. The officer like, hey. You already went to the bathroom. So I'm sitting in there. I asked my bro, I'm like, I'm like, man, you think this girl's setting us up? Because I told him to give him to her and I'll pay him, right? But he wasn't holding them at the time. So I was like, man, I think she set me up, man. And when I asked the, the teacher, can I go? I, asked, I said, man, I got to use the bathroom again. You going to not let me use the bathroom? So I'm sitting there. The officer walk in. Before the officer walk in, he was like, bro, we might as well take some of them. So I'm like, yeah, you're right. Let's try them. So I'm on the lower tabs with the guy, and I'm moving in slow motion. So we get outside. I want to run. My house is like the block over. So I'm so high. I'm like floating. I got on a bubble jacket. I got the lower tabs hidden good, right? And for some reason, something told me that she was going to set me up. I left majority of them in the bathroom at the school. And I had a few of them on me because he asked me to, let's try them. So we tried some, we had some more, and I had it like two or three of them still in my jacket because I was scared to take a lot of them, just took one. And now I'm high, the officer checking us. I'm like 16, so he checked me, he don't find it. I had to like, you remember the back in the day, the big uh, black j uh, bubble jacket with mm -hmm. the orange and the fur? Yeah. So he doesn't find it. And then he's like, man, let me see your jacket again. He found it. So that was my first charge, right? Possession of controlled substance. So I, I was forced to go to another alternative school. So I end up, but in my regular high school, I, I completed all my credits except for four. So now I'm in this other alternative school. I'm trapping out of there. You're not supposed to have a phone. It's like a juvenile program. I'm trapping out of that school, right? And I remember I'm in there and I leave. And I'm selling pounds of weed. At the time, I was getting, I was like 16. I was middleman of like 20 to 30 pounds of weed at a time, right? Guys would hit me up, and I'd have to play. But I didn't want to, I didn't have nowhere to hide at all. You know what I mean? I wanted more, but I didn't have nowhere to hide at all. My PO would just pop up any time. So one particular day, right, I just made a play for like 10 pounds. And I broke it down in a Jordan shoebox. I'm like 16. And I, I took the money. And I put it in a, a sock. And you remember back in the day, they had the jack with the connector phone, mm -hmm. the house phones. I snatched the, the jack out and I put it back in. I screwed it back in. Bro, my PO came to check on me. I had a curfew. I had a car too. I had Grand Marquis, all black Grand Marquis, with peanut butter guts. And it was parked out front. My PO came and at seven. 
So after she came, checked up on me, she, I came to the door clean. I got Jay's on. I guess she peeped the plate that I was about to leave as soon as she did her check-in, right? So she left. As soon as she left, I waited like five, ten minutes. I left. Remind you, I just hit a plate, and I got this money in there, and I still got a shoebox in there. She came back at like 7.45, double back on me. Went to my, went to my room, took my money, took the weed. It was like 17 point five in, in season stems and they charged me, right? I ended up getting an attorney. His name was George Durrell. He was like the drug dealer's attorneys that get people off, right? Him and his brother done. And bro, I ended up getting a suspended sentence and I ended up getting in trouble again. So now I'm on the block, I'm running the cars and it was called Sting Hard Rock 2005. I was the only juvenile in the Hard Rock Sting for selling crack. It's 2005, it was like 40 something people. I was the only juvenile, me and my homeboy that I convinced him to jump off the porch that same day. The first day he jumped off the porch, I gave him a pack. He ran up to a car, got a cell charge. Oh. So it was a lady. She was a taxi driver, and she came through, and she had she had laundry in a, in a um, laundry basket on the passenger side with a camera in it. So on my block, bro, they had in the newspaper more drive throughs than McDonald's. That's how many people. It was notorious to go out there to get cracked, right? On Love Dre, it was called The Country. So they would just drive down the street. It's a dead end, one, in, one way in, one way out. So I was young. These guys were smoking so much, I would run out, run them. And I run to the car, box out, put your hands in the window. Boom, this mine right here. And they'd be looking and choosing, right? The lady, she ended up getting me on the camera like two times. And I ended up seeing her in the mall after I turned myself in, right? But I just went up to her and I just told her, you're a rat, this and that. I didn't want to do nothing to her because I know that they would hit me for uh, tampering with a witness, right? But I, I went up to her and spazzed out her on her in the mall for setting me up. But it's two hoods in my city, right? It's Crosstown and my hood. My hood is notorious for jack boys at the time. It wasn't many hustlers that came out of my hood, right? But the other hood was our ops. They were hustlers. And when we are in school, it's like we can't be beefing all the time. I ended up getting tight when I was playing basketball with one of my homies that was from across town, right? And when the older cats started going to prison, like the streets was wide open, like who gonna be the next big man, you know what I mean? And when I was like 17, 18, I had a vision. Like when, you, when, I, when I came in here, you was telling me like the DuPont and stuff like that, all the cars, I was infatuated with cars. So I had this vision, I'm like, man, I want a Monte Carlo. Everybody want uh, box Chevys, I want a Monte Carlo. I'm gonna get a Monte Carlo on 28s. And I'm telling these dudes in my hood, they like, man, Jit, you wild. You ain't gonna do none of that. And they had been hustling like 10, 15 years, right? And they still on the block. So now I wanna do the opposite of what they're doing. I'm like, man, I'm gonna save my money. I'm gonna give me a connect. And so I started hanging out at the car shops. And one day I went up there, I saved my money. Um, I was taking a, a Jordan shoe box, wrapping it up with tape and just cut a slit in it. You remember like in Valentine's Day at school, we well, put little cars mm -hmm, at the top. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. And I, I wouldn't touch the money. So I'm reing up, reing up. Bro, I would hustle to re-up. I wouldn't spend my money. I would go to McDonald's and get the hot and spicy, no fry, hot and spicy and drink every time. Three times a day, I spend like four or five dollars a day just on food and just save my money. But the guys in my hood, they'll always try to finesse, sell you some bullshit work. And I remember one time I got finesse, I went to re-up to buy like a nine, I'm like 16. He, show, he sold me some remix and I was trying to cook it myself and he wouldn't return it. I'm like, nah, that'll never happen again. So I ended up buying a, a Monte Carlo 7500. I painted Incredible Hulk and put 28s on it. I was 18. And um, that's when I'm like, man, I love this car. I spent a lot of money on cars, you know what I mean? So I put 28 dub inch floaters on it. This is like 2008. And I'm like 18, but I ended up going to a juvenile facility and I turned 18 in a juvenile facility. So I was kind of like the shot caller in there because I was already known on the streets for getting money. When, even when I was in the juvenile detention centers, I was in and out of juvenile detention centers, 14, all the way up to 18. So when I got out, my mindset didn't change. That's when I got the money, Carlo, put on 28s, fiberglass, 40 inch screen, Xbox 360 in it, screens all through it. And I started hanging out at the car shops. So then I'm like, man, what can I find? A Mexican connect, right? I started going, hanging out at their bars, going to the car shops, getting on their scene, but I couldn't speak Spanish, right? So 
Now I'm like, all right, I'm going to approach him. So I started approaching him. I'm like, man, look, I'm not asking him to front. But mind you, I'm saving my money. So when I approach him, I'm like, look, I want to do business. You know what I mean? And their car shops, they would go put their cars in there, but they wouldn't hang out in there. They'll just leave. So I would just sit up there. I'm like, post it. I'm tired of getting finessed by my own people. You know what I mean? They, they trying to get over on you. And I end up connecting with one. He still tried to get over too as well. So I'm like, all right, I got to maneuver. I got to work my way up the ranks and try to find how I can make my own way. You know what I mean? Get my own big connect. So I was always like ambitious. And my mindset was like, okay, how can I become a big drug dealer and create my own team? You know what I mean? And at the time, bro, I didn't care about my consequences. My great aunt was my only connection to Florida. I didn't have any other family members. So she ended up dying in 2009 holding my hand. So this is 2009, Obama just became president, right? And I ended up getting addicted to lower tabs. Like somebody called me, they was like, I got 500 lower tabs. Or mind you, I took these lower tabs when I was like 16. I knew the feeling, I liked that feeling, but I never even took them again, right? I wasn't doing no drugs before then. I stopped smoking weed, so I'm selling like five to 10 pounds a perp like every couple of days. I only get it, I wouldn't even top my money. I only get it when the people call and they want it. So I just middleman, boom, cash, you know what I mean? So that was the hardest thing was like to just hide money. So I'm trapping, I'm 19, 20, and I'm like, okay, I want another car. But I ain't have nobody I could trust to put the cars in their name. At one point, I'm 21, I want to buy a Bentley, but I'm seeing Big Meech, he got caught because he's dealing with the exotic cars. So I'm afraid. I'm afraid to go cash out. So I see Boosie drop a, a, a Camaro with Infernos, Forgiados. So I go to my car shop, right? So I'm like, hey, I want these same Forgiados Boosie got on his yellow Camaro. This right before he got locked up. And I'm about to go grab the Camaro. I want to do everything. Once I get it, I want it all done in a week and a half, two weeks. I want Ostrogen size, uh, Outrageous Spectra Flare Blue, I already had this, the vision how I wanted my car, right? And I'm like, I'm going to chop the top of my Monte Carlo, same color back to back. I'm going to family homecoming, and I'm going to win the car show. Bro, I did all this stuff, and guess what they did? It started raining in Tallahassee. They seen me pull up. They canceled the car show. They knew I was going to win it, but I wasn't from Tallahassee. I'm from Fort Walton Beach, right? So me and my homies pull up. They canceled the car show. It's sprinkling a little bit. I'm thinking like, man, they didn't want to give me the, the, the trophy. You know what I mean? So... I end up calling Forgiato. So in order to um, order rims, you got to be a dealer, right? So I had a connection with all the car shops in, my, um, in my, my city. So I went to this car shop. I'm like, man, look, I want these Infernos. However much you got to pay, I want them here this week. So he was like, bro, they saying you can't get it until the following week. I was like, I need it for the car show. I need them. And I want them staggered. Inferno Forgiatos. Bro, they sent them with all the lips the same size, so I'm pissed. So I call him back, I'm like, bro, that's not how I ordered them, right? So it, they told me that Boosie had them made with the, with the fitting of a 750 Li BMW, right? So I'm talking, I was like, man, put the owner on the phone. Gary Forgiato, he messed up my, uh, my order. So he apologized, he was like, look, I'll let you, with your license, send me a copy of your license, anytime you wanna order a pair of rims through me, I'll give you wholesale rate. Just show the people whatever shop you want me delivered to, just show them your license. He was like, ride the rims. I was like, but I'm, I'm going to paint them blue. And he was like, just paint them and just send them back and I'll send you what you ordered, specialized. So I'm like, all right, cool. I rode the rims to uh, Family Homecoming and then I sent them back Then the Orlando Classics. That's one of the like, biggest car shows in Florida, right? I ended up winning the car show there. Uh, best paint and best interior, but I didn't stay to get my second trophy. But yeah, bro, it was like, I got into drug dealing at a young age and it was like, I became addicted to it, the fast money. It's, it's just hard to just stop. And then I felt like I didn't have no purpose. I didn't have no future. And me growing up without a father figure, it was like, okay, how can I get on the right track? And then having a lot of money at a young age, there was OGs trying to gravitate to me but I felt like it wasn't genuine, you know what I mean? They were trying to get around me to get what they can from me. So when I was younger, remind you, these guys have been on the block in my hood, been trapping 
they way older than me. They wouldn't serve me when I was young. So all my little homies, I made it where they had to buy from my homies. You get what I'm saying? So, and I was supplying the other hood as well. So it was like, okay, now my homies from my hood, they were jack boys. So I kept kind of like peace because I tell them don't rob them because that's mine. It's like mm -hmm. you're robbing me. You get what I'm saying? But then by the time I turned like 21, I got into club promoting. I started my own club promotion company. I mean, um, straight to the top entertainment. One of my biggest shows was with Nicki Minaj in 2011. So I ended up getting put on the game because my boy Exclusive J, that was T-Pain's manager, right? And T-Pain's manager, Exclusive J, he introduced him to Akon, right? He ended up getting died. He ended up getting killed in like 2012. I was supposed to do a show. He had a show lined up for me for like 100 bands for Drake. Mm. And he ended up getting killed with the back end money in Jacksonville. And Akon and, and T-Pain put up a million dollars. They posted on Twitter like, Whoever uh, let us know who killed our brother, we got $2 million. But he taught me the game with the club promoter. He was like, man, look, K.I., you come here every weekend in Tallahassee and you helping these promoters on the back end because they'll hit me up like, hey, we got a section, three grand, four grand, five grand, or you want a section on stage. And, bro, I used to spend like 10 grand, just 15 grand just going to party on the weekends with my homies. My homies would be like, Bro, we can't hang with you. We spend too much money. I'd be like, man, look, I got you. We can get back. Just, just splurge. You know what I mean? That was a lifestyle that I was addicted to. Mm. Just to be able to splurge and do what I wanted. You know what I mean? It's hard to walk away from that. And if you want to fast forward, right? When I ended up going to prison, it was like everything came to an end. I'm 23. I'm locked in a cell. Remind you, I was addicted to lower tabs and lean for four years, right? I ended up getting myself off of lower tabs in 2012. Can I ask you, what are lower tabs? Hydrocodone. Oh, okay. Bro, I was spending $300 a day. I was spending two grand a week just on my habits. Damn. And then it got to a point when I was buying the pints of lean, at that time it was $50, $50 a bar. So I was spending 800, I bought two, three pints of lean at a time. So it was like, I felt myself going down like a, a, a dark path, you know what I mean? I was spending so much money and I was making a lot of money at the same time, but I wanted change, right? So when I was a club promoter, dealing with that nightlife, it's like, okay, it's, it's hard to manage dealing with the nightlife and trying to get yourself off drugs and trying to change at the same time. Remind you, I didn't have a father figure, so I'm like, okay, now let me figure out something else. I started a carpet cleaning company. I knew the, I knew, the owners of the hotels, right? So one day I was in a um, hotel, I took off my Gucci shoes and my feet got wet. So I called the owner. I'm like, why is the carpet wet? He was like, uh, we just got the carpet clean. I'm like, look, if I get a carpet clean in business, will you give me the contract? Cause I knew him since I was like 15. Cause I used to rent hotels. My uncle used to grab the hotels from me. Cause after I caught the sale charge, I stopped trapping on the block. I switched, I switched up my hustle, right? And when I'm there and, he, and I talk to him, he's like, yeah, I'll give you the contract. So I ended up finding a business. I bought somebody old business for like 13,500 $13, and I ended up getting that contract. So I did a good job with cleaning the carpet. I ended up finding a, a old smoker that worked for Stanley Steamer. So he became <laughs> my employee. So me and him, we going to knock out the whole hotel. I got my, I got the pay. So now that owner, word of mouth, he gave me days in super eight, Best Western. So mm. now I'm cleaning all these places, right? But right before I got indicted, you know, I mixed business with pleasure. There was this chick from my city. She was like video vixen. She had clout back in the day. She was in Gucci Man videos and stuff. And um, I ended up dealing with her, but I wasn't in a relationship with her. But that was my ex friend. But at the time, she wasn't my ex friend, right? So I'm in Chicago. I know I'm about to get indicted. Indicted. I'm watching the um, 49ers and the Ravens. You remember when the Ravens won the Super Bowl with my, my aunt? So I know I'm about to go feds, so I want to go see my mom. I mean, see my aunt and get some personal things of my mom's. So when I got back, bro, my ex sold my whole carpet cleaning company, all my stuff in the back of my van. So remind you, I was trying to get out of the game. You know, I was an entrepreneur at heart. Like, 
I was a hustler. I knew how to network and I knew how to put together a big business plan to execute it, right? So I had the carpet cleaning business I'm trying to stop. So after that, when my whole equipment was gone, I'm like, all right, I went back head first. And I ended up getting set up by some guys in Mobile. They set me up. They told them I was a Mexican. I was tied to the cartel. They told these people all type of lies, right? So now these people pressing me. My case was never fed. My case was state. I fled from them after they set me up in Mobile, Alabama, right? I fled from them. They gave my case to the feds. Bro, they added up all this amount of dope. They're saying I was dealing with the guy for three months, and they put a large amount on me, right? And now I'm like, man, all right, so they sent my indictment in the mail. So I get the indictment in the mail. I go to the post office to sign to get it. The feds in the, U in the post office watching me get the letter, right? So I get the letter, I'm looking at it. So I'm like, all right, why should I stop now? So I'm like, okay, I might as well push it to the limit. So I made a decision, bad decision. It was a drought. I was known to have it in a drought. When nobody else had it, I had it, right? I had to work. So my homies were like, man, I want this, I want that. So I'm like, all right, I, I have it next, tomorrow, right? I end up getting on I-10, driving to Texas. Bro, I'm driving on I-10, I get to Texas. I stop at this chick house in Texas, but I handle my business, but I didn't turn and go back, right back, right? So that following morning, I'm driving and I get caught in traffic in Texas. So when I get in, caught in traffic, you know how you're on that interstate and the officer is finishing a ticket? So the car is pulling off, the officer pulls off and he gets right beside us, right? My cousin is in the car and my cousin in the car, I'm like, bro, put on your seatbelt. So he didn't have on a seatbelt. The officer came up, looked in, seen he didn't have a seatbelt on, slowed down, got behind us. Bro, the music is on. It's rich homie. Let's have a party, right? So my cousin like, what you about to do when he threw the lights? Man, I just floored it. High speed chase, right? I can't do a high speed chase going over 100 miles per hour and argue with my cousin what to do, right? So I told him, look, I'm going to get off on this exit. You jump out and run. Because you know, by law, the officer has to stop the vehicle and protect uh, civilians, right? He can't chase both of us. So I get off in Beaumont, Texas. I drive around the, the movie theater. It's just one officer at the time. And I'm like, jump out, jump out. He froze up. I gave him like three grand on my pocket. I'm like, jump out and run. He can run with everything, and I get the fleet and loot, and that's it. You know what I mean? And... Bro, I get off, I go around the, around the uh, movie theater, take the officer around the movie theater. A dump truck tried to do a citizen arrest, block me off, so I, I'm like in a Buick rendezvous. It only go like 110, 120 max. And I, I drive it like a four-wheeler, I go over the median, and I go on the opposite side of the road. And I take, I take the police officer around the Holiday Inn and the gas station, I'm telling him to jump out again, he freezes up. He tells me, go up the opposite side of the road on I-10. So I went head on with traffic for like 30 seconds. I'm like, bro, you suicidal. Boom, I went back over the median. So now I'm going high speed chase. High speed chase is like 48 minutes. But I'm going on and off. He froze up and then jump out, right? So they put the spikes down. I maneuver around the spikes. I'm going on and off, on and off, hoping I can make it to Louisiana. And I end up getting to the last exit in Texas and I go off the, in, the express road. In Texas, you can ride right next to the uh, interstate. And I'm riding, I'm going on and off the express. And I got to the last one, and it was like a split second decision I had to make, right? The police officers were at the last uh, exit, and they're standing like this, like over my dead body. You either gonna hit us or try to hit this U-turn. So I try to hit the U-turn going like 95 miles per hour, and the back tire on the passenger side blows out. And it caused the car to like hit the concrete pillar like this going 90. And bro, it was like an outer body experience. I know it was nothing but God. I like blacked out and I like seen like white lights and it like flash. And then I just came back and I boom, I took off my seatbelt, I jump out. I got on Fendi shoes, so they very narrow. So when I jump out, I kind of like roll my ankle. And I got probably like 15, 20 feet. Officer hit me with a taser. 
So now I'm on the ground. I'm hoping my cousin alive because I now I, I spin over and I skin my face on the concrete because they got me on the concrete. I spin just to look at the truck, make sure my cousin is all right. And I skint my face and the officer like stumped my head on the ground and skint my face some more. He was like, you see what you did? You put uh, civilians' lives in danger. And I'm just sitting there. So then all of a sudden I hear my cousin start like screaming, crying. His leg, his leg is turned. The hardest bone to break in your body is your femur. He broke his femur. His leg is turned backwards facing his ass. Mm. And he's screaming. They snatching him out and it's pulling his leg. So I'm pissed to the fact that he didn't throw everything. So now they don't put they don't put half a brick on the uh, oh. half a brick on the on the hood, and now the 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 police, all the news people come. They put me on the front of the newspaper. I get in there. I end up burning out fifty five thousand, fifty five hundred. I get out. I slip through the cracks. It's Easter. The bells bomb and let me out. And I had a federal hold. I guess they just wanted the money. They took the money. I get out. So now I'm out for like two weeks. I'm wanted by the feds. And I got this state case in Texas, right? So I'm riding one day, my homie with me, and basically I sacrificed for him because I didn't want him to get tied up in my bullshit. I knew the, I knew the feds was looking for me. So I'm in a town where I'm familiar with. I could have put him on a high speed chase and jumped out and ran, but I'm thinking about my homie, like I don't want him to get caught because he don't, he's not familiar with the city. If I get out and run, he gonna get caught. So what I did was I just pulled over. I'm like, bro, just run. You know what I mean? I pulled over and I got out, put my hands up. He ran and he did exactly what I anticipated in my head. He hid up under a house right next door. <laughs> and the dude shot at him, the dude's yard he was in. And then he ended up running to my, um, he seen my guy that used to work for me cleaning the carpet. He let him in, right? But if I would have got out and ran, he would have got caught. And then I didn't want that on my name that he got tied up in with me. You know what I mean? But I ended up keeping all, 100 or all my homies. Some of them looked out while I was doing my bid. But while I was in there, right, I was focused on how can I change my mindset, right? I, I knew, okay, this life is over. I know I got a lot of time to do. I weighed like 145 pounds. And, you know, in the jail, you start hearing about the politics, the gangs in federal prison. So I ended up getting sentenced to like 70 months. However, they said, okay, you still got to go see Texas because they tried to like send my attorney to me, hey, we'll offer you a plea agreement and we'll sweep that Texas case on the rug if you cooperate with us. I'm like, man, I can't do nothing. I can't help y'all. Bro, I ended up getting to Memphis, Tennessee as soon as I got there. Boom, got there on a Friday, August 1st, 2014. So you know how you walk in and then you got to go to the laundry get your stuff, get your mat, get your uniform and stuff. They was like, hey, homie, which one of y'all from Florida? It was a Haitian homie. He's like, man, you got two weeks. Get your pay How your paperwork? I'm like, all right, cool. I have mine. Mine coming. So um, a little bit after that, like I was telling you, they told me, look, go to the chow hall with certified. It was a homie from Jacksonville. I'm like, all right, cool. He worked softball. And he was like, look, you won't have to wait till they say last call. I'll be done keeping the score for softball. Bro, I'm starving. We flew, you know how Con Air worked. We flew from Oklahoma, from Oklahoma to Atlanta, from Atlanta to uh, <laughs> Memphis, Tennessee, right? I'm starving. We only ate. You know, they feed you those little cookies and, and little bullshit bologna sandwich. Then when we arrived, they gave us a little fish sandwich with some fruit. So I'm like, I'm starving now at this point. So I'm like, man, look, I don't need no babysitter. I'm walking in the child hall myself. Bro, I walked in there. This one I knew it was real, how segregated it was. So I walked in, it's whites, it's Mexicans to the right. The line's short on the right. To the left, it's all blacks. They're segregated, GDs, BDs, vice lords, bloods, crips. So I went to the right. I'm like, man, all right, I'm gonna go over here and get my tray. And it was so crowded to the left, I didn't know where to sit. So I seen the table open, not knowing it's the Paisa Los Zetas cartel table. So grab my tray, I walk, I sit down, I'm eating. Prior to me arriving there, there was a race ride, black and Mexican, right? So I'm sitting there, I'm eating, and I look up, I feel somebody hovering over me. I look to the right, he was like, hey, hey homie, where you from? No, he, he said, hey homie, what's your race? I'm like, I'm like, I'm black and white. 
He was like, you need to get up from this table and go over there. I'm like, man, look, I'm going to finish my food. I'm almost done. But then when he said that, I looked up and I see like 20 eyeballs staring at me. It's like 20 Mexicans just staring at me hard, staring a hole in me. So I'm like, bro, where, where I need to go? So then I picked, <laughs> up the, I picked up the tray and I went back there. And then now like all the non-gang affiliates from the South, they all sat at one table. So everybody from like Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Virginia, all the way down. They're like, homie, you coming straight off the bus about to start a ride. I'm like, man, I, I didn't know. However, a guy, so I was in, so they sent me to Inglewood, Colorado for a mental evaluation for beating up an officer in Mobile because the officer was cousins with the rat that set me up. So they sent me to the shoe, bro, for three months, took my mat, I'm sleeping on concrete for three months, nothing but concrete because I was exposing the rat that told on me and his cousin worked in there, mm. right? So they're torturing me. So, I'm bro, I'm, I had to learn how to sleep on my stomach. To this day, I can't even sleep on my side. It fucked up my shoulder and my hip. And the officer like would talk shit, I'll never forget, it was 4th of July, 2000, 2013. And you know they give you special meals on, during the holidays. Yeah. Bro, he bucked me. Sleep weight, lose weight. I'm like, man, you're not gonna give me my meal? Bro, they taking me out to sell. They put me in the turtle suit for no reason. Just put me in there just because I was exposing a rat on my case. I'm telling everybody. Tell them what the turtle suit is. The turtle suit is where they consider that you're suicidal, right? And when I came in, I wasn't used to going to sleep at night. So I'm sleeping during the day and I'm up at night. So they take notes and they observe, okay, oh, that's suicidal uh, uh, behavior. You stand up all night. So I'm standing up all night and I'm reading the Bible and I go to sleep like probably like four in the morning and I sleep until like 11, right? That was my routine. I couldn't sleep because I was trying to, I was having withdrawals from taking Molly and drinking lean. So I'm trying to like force myself to sleep. I couldn't adjust easy when I got in there. So now this officer, one particular officer would come on shift and there was a guy in there and he, he would tell me, he's like, bro, quit disposing these rats. They're still on the street. They're going to they're gonna put you in the, in the shoe in here because you're exposing an informant that they still using on the street. So I'm like, nah, man, I want everybody to know in here who, who he is. You know what I mean? So his cousin was on shift, and he said something to me. I said, man, your cousin a rat. And, bro, the next day, on my birthday, on my 24th birthday, they put me in the shoe for no reason. And, I, and they can't explain why they put me in the shoe. They told me because you stand up late at night reading the Bible, and that's suicide behavior. I'm like, how's that suicidal behavior? So I, and then I said, explain to me why I'm standing here so long. So long. They, didn't, they didn't give me the explanation. Bro, get in there. He moved from the pod, the federal pod, and now he working back here where I'm at. So I'm like, man, what type of shit is this? So he comes, every time he on shift, bro, up, no food. And then when they let me out, straight to the shower, back in the, back in the cell. No phone. I try to go to the phone, no phone. I'm like, where's the warden? Let me talk to somebody. I can't talk to nobody. Bro, I was in the shoe so long, I could tell the time from the, from the sun shining in. I could tell from what time it is from the sun, the shadow on the bricks. No cap. And I would tell them, they'll, they'll come in there like, Lust, what time it is? If you tell us what time it is, we'll give you a sandwich. I'm like, man, look at this. I got to fucking tell them what time it is to get a fucking sandwich. No commissary, no nothing. So oh, now, so shit. I told the dude one day, bro, I'm so hot after 4th of July. I'm so hot with him, right? I was like, man, I'll beat your bitch ass. I was like, come in this cell without a taser, bro. They're tasering me with a taser shield. Bro, I got tasered like 50 times in there. And he, uh, he said, tomorrow I'm going to come in there. I'll give you a fade. That's what you want. I was like, all right. I hit the button. I said, well, what's up? You going to come in here? Come in here without your crew. <laughs> bro. At this time, I'm like 135 now, because they done starved me. I'm like 135. So I already got my mind made up what I'm going to do. If he do finally come in here, I'm going to stand up on the bunk, and I'm going to Superman punch him. I'm going to jump down. <laughs> Bro, for real, listen, uh, on everything I love, he hit the button. He's like, Luster, what's up? You ready? I'm like, ready for what? I'm like, you coming in here? Don't bring no taser. Take your belt off. He did it, right? He came in. So now, when he got like real close to the door, I stood up on the bunk. I waited for him to come all the way in. Superman punched him. Boom! I drove, <laughs> jumped at him. 
hit him right in this shit. <laughs> bro, he fell out. He flew out the cell. <laughs> then he hit the fucking, he hit the cold. <laughs> he hit the cold. Officers came in. They tased me. And then they sent me to uh, Eaglewood, Colorado. You remember uh, Carmelo Anthony had that party, like, probably like 06 or 07. And that Denver Bronco player got killed. Right? You remember that? I was locked up. Yeah, Denver Bronco player ended up getting killed at Carmelo party. So when I went to the shoe, they, they had me in the shoe still in transit, right? So they sent me to Atlanta. I get to Atlanta. The lieutenants was cool. Gucci man was in there. Gucci man was in the pod. Bro, he was buying everybody commissary in his pod. So I think he was in C and I was in D. They put me in a pod with nothing but Puerto Ricans. Don't speak English. All of them speak Spanish. There's only one brother in there. He was like from uh, Virgin Island somewhere, but he spoke English and Spanish. So I remember I'm in there. Bro, I've been in the shoe the whole summer of 2013. So I'm seeing videos. I see uh, T.I. Young Thug about the money on the TV, and then they change the channel. So I'm mad. I'm like, man, I want TV. I don't know about the politics. Bro, I went and grabbed the controller. Puerto Ricans like ran down on me speaking in Spanish. I'm like, bro, what they saying? He was like, man, you, you, they gonna fuck you up by the TV. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, I don't got a clue. So I don't got a clue about the politics. So um, I'm like, bro, what is this? A Spanish Spanish unit? <laughs> and I went and pressed the button, and I'm like, hey, I get the lieutenant to put me in there. I'm like, can you put me in a different pot? It was like, nah, you supposed to be in the shoe. You want to go back to the shoe or you want to stay in here? <laughs> so I'm like, nah, I'm going to stay in here. <sighs> so I, they locked us down, right? When they locked us down, I'm like talking to my cellie. He the only one speak English. So I'm like, bro, go holler at the shot caller, whoever it is, the Puerto Rican, ask, can I get this TV? And if it get to the point where they give him pushback, tell him I'll pay for it. However much they want, let me use the TV. And he want to holler at him. And I think they was like, they was like giving pushback at first. I was like, what they want? Some commissary, a radio or something? Let me get the TV until I go. I'll probably be here like a week or two. So he brought him over there, translate. He didn't, he didn't charge me. He was like, we'll let you use this TV. He was like, but only when some game, soccer game or something come on, let us use it. I'm like, all right, cool. And then I end up just throwing him something just for letting me use it. So I'm watching all the videos and listen to the radio. Gucci getting sentenced while I was there. And um, I end up getting to California, Colorado. They put me back in the shoe. I'm thinking I'm gonna go back to population. They put me back in the shoe. They put me in the shoe next to the dude that they accused of killing um, the Denver player. Mm. He been in there four years. They trying to give him the fold. So I'm in there rapping. I'm rapping Rich Homie. I'm rapping all the songs that I knew from off the streets, right? And he telling me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> so he's like, youngster, shut the fuck up. <laughs> So I'm steady rapping, I'm steady rapping. <laughs> and you know how they, they call the uh, Soul Warriors. So we going out. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know, he, he, he crip, right? And I don't know who he is. So they end up letting him out. They let me out first, they let him out. They put me in the cell with his homie. It was a dude named Roach, he was a crip. And remind you, this is my first time dealing with, being in prison, dealing with politics, right? So we're in Inglewood. Bro, we get there. They just had a riot. This prior before me getting to Memphis, Tennessee. They just had a riot. So I'm in there. They put me in a cell with a Puerto Rican, but I ended up moving in with the black guy named Roach. He ended up hollering at the, um, the counselor, get me in there. He was like, you probably want to get in here. We're going to get locked down. He knew all the politics that was about to happen. So this is where I sat at the wrong table the first time, and I ended up making the same mistake in Memphis, right? So I'm sitting at this table. The Colorado Mexicans come up to me and was like, hey, what are you? And I'm like, man, I'm black and white. They was like, you need to go talk to him. So I guess he was a shot caller for the blacks, but he was a crip. I talked to him. He's like, look, uh, you black and white? Your dad black? I'm like, yeah. He was like, I'm going to get you out this cell and moved in this cell because um, we're about to go on lockdown. So he told me the whole play was about to happen, and it ended up happening. So uh, a Colorado Mexican about to stab a Paisa Mexican about the tables because they tried to take their table mm -hmm. where they eat at, right? And we ended up getting on lockdown. The dude that I was fussing at with in the, in the shoe ended up coming out the shoe. So he sit at the table, but we never seen each other's faces. Right. 
we sit at a table because when we went to, you know, when you're in a shoe, they take you to the uh, rec yard. Mm -hmm. You go through the little cage. We never went out together, right? So I'm sitting there eating. It was hamburger day, and I didn't have no ketchup, right? And he said, I said, hey, bro, I can get some ketchup. He said, nigga, I know you. I'm like, I, I said, I was like, nah. He's like, why you asking me for some ketchup then? So I'm like, all right, bro, cool. Yeah, I don't want your ketchup. So he was like, man, I know your voice. You was that young, you was that young kid back there rapping all night, stand up all night. He was like, man, what's wrong with you? I was like, man, I was just trying to do my time, man. He was like, uh, he said something else, but then Roach was like, nah, he cool, he cool, man. So I had clout because, like, you know, in there, it's be all you can be. You know, a lot of people say what they was doing in the streets, but none of them, not many of them show it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm showing it. So me and his homeboy ended up getting tight. He was like, man, let, let the youngster ride, man, let him ride. That's my homeboy. He was like, oh, that's your celly? He was like, he wild. He stayed up all night rapping. He wouldn't go to sleep. I'm like, man, look, I'm trying to adjust to being in here. Y'all been in here for a long time. I can't sleep at night. I sleep like 3 in the morning. I go to sleep 4 in the morning. It was like that for a whole year. I couldn't sleep. I ended up, bro, I was buying like 14 honey buns uh, a week, eating two honey buns. I wake up out of my sleep and eat a honey bun. <laughs> then I realized, I realized I was starting to put on a belly. And, and I ended up going in like a depression cave. I'm in there. I'm like, man, it's hard to adjust because I'm calling to the streets. I'm hearing about what's going on. I'm like, man, all right, I got to disconnect from the streets, stop calling and focus on becoming a better version of myself, right? So... When I seen that little taste of the feds and then they sent me back to get sentenced, then I went to Memphis, I started working out with a workout crew. But the games ran the, the weights there. You couldn't just go pick up the weights and start lifting. They had Smith machines in Memphis. So I ended up hollering at my boy. He ended up, me and him becoming tight. His name was Rashad. And um, he worked out with the crew. And the shot caller, that workout crew, had two life sentences plus 10 years. But I didn't know, right? So he was like, bro, if I let you in, I got to check your paperwork. And then, but they, all of them don't have to see it. Long as I see it and I let them know, then you can come work out with us. Because he approached me originally asking me um, about the promotion game. I'm like, bro, I'll give you the promotion game, club promotion game, if you let me work out with you guys. Boom, I get down with them, start working out. <clears throat> the only time he talked to me like, hey, what's up, youngster? He was like, look, you know, I take my workout uh, crew serious. You quit one rep, you can't come back. You don't show up one time, Monday through Friday, you can't come back. I'm like, all right, I'm down. Bro, they pushed me so hard, I didn't know if I had to shit or throw up. I wanted to quit. I ain't gonna lie, I wanted to quit. And just that seed he planted, like of commitment, it just changed my mindset. I realized, okay, I could push beyond my limits of what I think my body can do, you know what I mean? And I worked out with them for like six, seven months. But I got sent to that medium high because I beat up the officer. I didn't get charged, but they put it on my um, my record, my prison mm -hmm. record. So it made my points increase because I was a nonviolent offender. So when I got there, right, I was in a three-man cell, and they had two-man cells. So I'm trying to finesse and get a two-man cell so I can get the cell phone, you know what I mean? And it was a GD that I'm hollering at trying to get in the cell with them. And... Like, they'll do their background on you. They got the certain officers that'll show them, tell you stuff about you. You know what I mean? So he, he was like, bro, what, why you here? You not a game banger? Bro, it was every, I mean, every cell game banging. The first cell they put me in, right? I remember I came off the bus. They locked me in the cell. They put me in the cell with two crips. Between both of them, they had 30 years. And it was like 40 years old and 50 years old. And... They didn't say a word to me. I went in there. I'm on the, bro, the top bunk in Memphis, if you, I hit my head for like eight days straight when I got up, boom, hit my head on the roof. I had to get used to like just going like this and then getting off. And when they locked me down for the first time with both of them, I remember Trey Loke was sitting with his headphones on watching TV. They did the count. The other, the other homie, he was sitting in the middle bunk. He slid out. Trey Lowe turned around, took his headphones off, say, homie, what you banging? I'm like, man, what you mean when I'm banging? I'm like, bro, I'm from Florida. I don't, I don't bang. I'm a hustler. He was like, this is a low house. So I'm already getting the vibe that they basically saying I got to go, right? I'm not knowing the celly before me 
was a homie from Florida, so they don't like dudes from Florida. Mm. He got into it, my homie certified, the one I told you I was supposed to go to the chow hall with. So, and I don't know that he was about to stab my homie. Mm. So I'm thinking like, damn, why didn't they tell me anything? I'm in the blind, right? So they start asking me questions, stuff like that. They was like, uh, go holler at your homie certified. He'll probably put you on game. He was like, then I want to holler at him. He's like, he told you that? He's like, yeah. He's like, man, like two years ago, three years ago, when I came off the bus, I got into it with him. I'm like, bro, why you ain't tell me? You got me going in here. I'm in the blind. You know what I mean? So I end up moving cells. And then I want to get in a two-man cell. And I told the GD, he was like, he asked me why, why I was at a medium high if I'm a nonviolent offender. And I told him, man, look, I beat up an officer. He like, you cap. He went and asked the lady, he was like, man, you crazy. You did beat up officers. It's, <laughs> it's, it's in the paperwork. I'm like, yeah. So I ended up moving in a cell with him. Then Texas came and got me. Remind you, remember in the beginning, I told you, they told me that Texas still going to try me on the charges. I get over there. They come pick me up. Bro, it's two guys. They pilots and officers. They came pick me up in the Camry from federal prison, put me in the Camry handcuffs, when it got on this small propeller jet, I'm scared to death because we just watched a documentary with Aaliyah the day before they picked me up. <laughs> that small propeller jet, it looked exactly like it. So we get on this jet. It's like a, a six man. And they were like, oh, you were a drug trafficker. Hey, and I'm like, oh, what does that got to do with anything? They just want to start a conversation. So I said, it looked like y'all took this, this, uh, this heli I mean, this plane, this propeller jet from a drug trafficker. It was like, you're pretty close. We uh, seized money and we bought it from an auction. We seized money from the cartel and bought it from an auction. So I ended up getting to Beaumont, Texas, Jefferson County. That's where I had the state case, right? So I'm in there and they got a hella politicking going on in there as well, gang banging. And there's no structure. So they just wild, they disrespectful. And it's open bay. Right, I ended up getting on a fight in there. But I got sentenced to 20 years. I went to trial, lost in trial, sentenced to 20 years, sent me back to Memphis, had to show that I got sentenced, you know what I mean? So show all the paperwork that that's where I went. Get back, then I was transferred for good behavior after being in Memphis for a year to Miami. Got to Miami, no politicking, right? So I'm telling my cell, he's like, look, I want to see your work. And I'm like, man, they're not even showing paperwork. But the chomos, all them, they protected down there. If you do anything, you press up on anybody, you're going back to the medium high. You know what I mean? So I get there, and I went to the yard. I said, I want to work out with the toughest workout crew. They sent me to this guy named Wild Bill. Wild Bill had the toughest workout crew. He had a, a, a life sentence. He was stabbing people. He had a reputation of putting fear into people, right? But he ended up getting his case overturned. He had like 25 years. He had already been down like 18. I went up to him. He said, Youngs, you ain't ready for this. You too light skinned. You're going to quit. You're going to give up. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, man, you ain't even give me a chance. Remind you, I've been working out like six months. So I thought I was like, you know what I mean? Tough on that level. So he was like, look, I'm going to test drive you right now. Bro, it's like, 150 people watching because everybody's scared to work out with him and commit with, to him. He only had like six people working out with him. And he was like, here you go, 315. I'm like, no warm up? I'm like, hold on, let me stretch or something, do some push ups or something. So, remind you, I'm using Smith machines. I'm not used to free weights. So, I got 315. I almost got it. And he's like, your triceps gave out. He's like, 275. I'm like, I don't get no break. He's like, yeah, that's how we roll. Your break is the person in front of you. So if you're in the front, you're not getting a break. I'm like, all right, got the 275. I hit it three reps. He's like, nah, 255. So all the weights is welded on. You know mm. what I mean? You can't take the plates off. <clears throat> Pig iron. Yeah. So uh, he's like, nah, from the two, 275, 255, 225. He take me through this crazy circuit, right? And he said, you pass. Monday, show up. And I was like, all right. So I ended up becoming the leader of the car. Like, you know, in there, if you outwork somebody when working out, they call it, you drop them off, right? So every Monday, everybody get in each other's face. You call out who you want to lift against. Then on Friday, you lift. So 
it was a lot of guys, like, wasn't nobody in North Florida standing up to the guys in South Florida, so I was the only one. So it got to a point where all these guys calling me out, like, in your weight range, right, weight class. I'm dropping off everybody that, that called me out, right? So then I ended up getting the second strongest in my workout crew. When I started, I was, like, the fourth or fifth. And I told Wild Bill, I'm gunning for you. You're getting old. You're 62 now. So then, like, the last couple workouts before he left, he went to the drug program. I dropped him off one time, and he had to make a decision who he was going to give the keys to the car to, and he gave it to me. I became the leader of the workout crew. That's when I knew I found my passion for fitness, and I knew, okay, this is my outlet to change, right? I'm going to become a certified trainer, and I'm going to get out. I'm going to stick to my path. And while I was in there, so I ended up getting caught with a cell phone. I stayed at that prison two years. They sent me back to a meeting, sent me to South Carolina, straight gang banging there. And as soon as I arrived on the yard, it's like 150, home, 150 homies from Florida, and they bullying. They, they get into it with the Crips. They get into it with the GDs. And I holler at the shot caller. I'm like, bro, here go my work. He was like, I already know you. And they already heard about me in the system from working out. So now they coming up to me wanting to work out with me. Mm. So I'm like, man, this is my calling. So I had a broke foot. So I'm in the building. I broke my foot in transit. I don't know if you know, if you got a medical condition in transit, they put a hold on you. So I didn't go to the nurse. I got a broke foot the entire time. Bro, we in Atlanta. You been to Atlanta holdover? No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to go to Atlanta. Bro, it's wild. So they put me in a cell with a homie that had like 18, he been down like 18 years. And the homies got into it, the homies from Florida got into it with the guys from Atlanta. And a dude from Atlanta stole one of my homies uh, from Jacksonville stole his commissary. So the homie from Jacksonville walking around, going in, in the Serenio cells, getting to it with Serenios, he's like, man, y'all seen who stole my commissary? So now I had size on me, right? And he come looking for me because I'm from North Florida to ride with him. But bro, I got like 10 months left. I'm trying to parole out when I get to Texas. I'm trying to go through here without no beef, you know what I mean? And there's this Jamaican that came in for a fraud case. And while we was in transit in Oklahoma, the homie told me to take, out, take care of him. So I'm, I'm already looking after him because he fresh. He don't know nothing. He don't got a clue. It's like I'm babysitting him, right? So I'm on the phone. You, bro, you got to wait literally like an hour to an hour and a half to use the phone in Atlanta. So he came up to me while I'm on the phone. I done already waited an hour and a half. He like, hey, Jacksonville wants you. So I'm like, man, tell him I'm on the phone. Not knowing that he want me to ride with him to who stole his commissary. Of course, but now I got a broke foot. You know what I mean? But I'm on the phone. So while I'm on the phone, all, of I, all I hear is somebody hollering. Bro, he took the squingy, you know, the squingy yeah, uh, yeah. stick. Yeah, he, he took the squingy stick and hit the two Atlanta dudes up across the head with it. Then it broke, and then he's still taking the broke part, and he kind of like trying to stab him with the broken wooden part, right? So now I'm here in lockdown. I'm still not getting off the phone. I don't know what happened, right? So I'm still on the phone. Officer come hang up my phone call. And end up getting to the cell. They tell me what happened. They like, man, he came up here looking for you. Just so happened, but I was on the phone. Now we get locked down. Now we got beef with Atlanta, right? So we in there. My celly, he's so dumb. Like, bro, he's been locked up 18 years. He go smoke some Tunchi with the guys from Atlanta, and they laced him up. Now he tripping about to jump off the top tier. We get in the cell, locked down. He throwing water out the toilet, having a whole oh. episode. And, bro, I, it's like I'm babysitting him. But from there, before that happened, how I broke my foot, I'm in Miami, the Haitians, and the Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican, he could say he can jump rope, but I'll jump rope everybody. He out jump rope one of the Haitian guys. I'm landing the bunk. I don't gamble. I stopped gambling because I caught the OGs doing the uh, little tricks. You know how they be cheating with the poker? Taking the needle and marking it. Marking the cards with the Yeah, yeah, so until you know which card you're know holding. Yeah. Exactly. So I caught him doing that, and I stopped playing poker, right? So I stopped. I said, okay, I'm going to stop gambling too. They, uh, they finessing. They cheating. Uh, I ain't about to play with these people about my money. And they, the Haitians told the Puerto Ricans, let's bet 500 my homeboy can out-jump this guy. So they come, up here, they come up here, they're waking me up, like, hey, K.I., K.I., we just betted on you. I said, how y'all going to bet on me? And I ain't even agree. It was like, nah, come get this. It's going to be free cash. I know you can beat them. So get down there. Bro, I don't got no shoes. I'm in transit, 
right? So I didn't buy any because I'm going to get my shoes when I get to my, the next prison. So they go in, they like, what size you wear? Bro, they give me some shoes. They too tight. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to jump rope in the slides. I end up taking off the slides. I'm just jump roping in socks. He went first. It was like five rounds. He went first. I went first. He, and then I did everything he did plus more, right? And then I started trying to show out, and I was going so fast, my sock slid off, and the jump rope went between my, my pinky toe, and I cracked the, cracked, oh, the, man. cracked the top of my foot. And, bro, I'm taking uh, the ibuprofen, ibuprofen, because I don't want to stay in the building long. I want to get to the next prison. I get to South Carolina, go to the nurse. I got a broken foot. They put me in a boot. Put me in a boot. A riot happened with Florida and, and the Crips. I took the boot off. I'm like, man, I'm not about to be a walking duck. I got to take the boot off. We got beef. So now my foot, like, basically just didn't heal properly. So I'm working out. Had a workout crew there. And that's when I, when I became a certified personal trainer. That's when I knew, okay, my mindset changed. I wasn't thinking about the streets no more. I wasn't thinking irrationally no more. I was thinking rationally, okay, here's my plan. I'm on. I started studying this guy, his name was Khan Body. And I told the officer, like, print up everything on Google about this guy, right? He did time in Rikers Island and um, he ended up getting out as a trainer and changing his life. So I seen a men's health magazine and his story was in it. So it was inspiring to me, I'm like, man, if he can change, that was his exit route, that could be mine too, you know what I mean? So then I ended up getting to Texas, and I got another omen. I seen him on the Rachel show. I'm like, man, this man, he took it all the way through fitness and came out of prison, you know what I mean? And I'm like, okay, that gave me confidence that I can do it, even though I knew that I had to be mentally prepared to be rejected, right? So I ended up getting out. I paroled out in the state of Texas with a parole attorney. I ended up not having to go to prison, but I did a year in the county jail after the five years in federal prison. Paroled out. They didn't allow me to go back to Florida. So I had to start my life over in Beaumont, Texas, a city where I had the high profile case. So I knew I wasn't going to get an opportunity. So what they do at the 20? I'm on parole still. I oh, got like shit. 12, 13 years right now. Oh, shit. So, um, bro, they let me out. I get to the halfway house. Bro, this guy's openly getting on the phone. Hey, I'm calling to register. I'm like, man, what? Everybody's sex offenders. I'm like, and then they talking about the case on the, in front of me. I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. And, bro, I'm riding my bike. I'm going everywhere in Texas, I mean, in Beaumont, to apply for a job. I'm going to all these gyms. And when I go in there, I present all my documents. I mean, all the the requirement, requirements, right? I give them my certification. All of them told me no, and I was straightforward with my story. I'm like, look, I made some bad decisions when I was younger. However, I changed my life. Hey, just give me an opportunity, I guarantee I won't blow it. Nobody gave me an opportunity because when they Google my name, that high speed chase showed up, right? So my whole mindset was, okay, how can I change the narrative of my story? But I just need the opportunity. So. It got discouraging. At the time, I was a pescatarian, so my backup plan, okay, if nobody hires me at a, at a gym, I'm going to get a job at a restaurant so I can stick to my diet and stay in shape. Bro, I was riding like six miles a day, seven miles a day on a bike just to work. So I'm losing all my muscle mass. I'm like so discouraged. It's going through my head like, man, you can make one phone call and get back right, you know what I mean? But I thought about all them times I was jumping on the rec yard, jumping rope, barbed wire fence, because I did the majority of my time on the rec yard. I was like just straight working out. And I thought about how many nights I prayed for this opportunity, and I'm not going to blow it. You know what I mean? So I'm going to persevere through these hard times, and I know somebody's going to give me a shot. Bro, I'm a server. I'm serving at Golden Corral. I hated the job so bad. I was making probably like 80 to 120 a day from tips, and just one day, I just quit, and I had a dream. God gave me a dream to go become a member at the gym you want to be a trainer at, right? Exigent Health and Fitness Club, the guy, the owner that gave me an opportunity, he's featured in the Forbes article that my story is in with me, right? So I went in there, I created my, um, my corporation, Streets to Fitness, created my Instagram, Streets to Fitness, and I was working out, filming, I was training someone, and 
I seen somebody watching me. You know, when you're in prison, your awareness level mm -hmm. is top tier. So when I got out, my awareness level was still like on prison time. So I'm watching everybody in the gym. It's a huge gym, like 11,000 members. So I see a guy in a suit standing behind the Stairmaster. He's watching me. Just so happened, he's the owner. The fitness director told on me, told the owner that I was in the gym training and I'm not a trainer there. So I'm about to do my first post on Instagram, my second post. And I'm sitting at the table in the front lobby and a guy says, hey, Kip, can you come to my office real quick? I'm like, man, how, how do you know me? You know what I mean? And I just turned in my second uh, application. And the lady, the membership coordinator said, I'll put it in the right man's hand that can give you a job. So he's calling me in his office to confront me about training in his gym. I apologized respectfully and I told him my story and it brought tears to his eyes. It just so happened, God worked in mysterious ways. He does prison ministry mm. in the prisons in Texas. He was like, look, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. He was like, I'm going to hire you at my Nederland location. I don't know the area in Texas. I'm living in Beaumont, bro. I moved out the halfway house into a hood in South Park off of Highland Avenue with straight trenches. And remind you, I grew up in a hood in Florida. So the, my PO at the halfway house told me, look, you're not going to get an apartment anywhere but the hood. So you better off staying in here. I didn't want to stay in there because they were taking my food. I was buying fish to stick to my diet, they were taking my food. You couldn't have food in the halfway house. So they forced me to eat foods that I didn't want to eat, and they wouldn't allow me to go to any more gyms to fill out applications. So now he gives me the job, bro, the bike ride like an hour on the highway to go to the job. So now I'm catching Uber. My Uber costs more than my paychecks mm. that I was getting at first. Because you get commission, you gotta get clientele. So I'm so discouraged, I'm like, man, this might not be my calling, this might not be the right route for me, you know what I mean? And I changed my mindset, okay, look, I used to hang out on the block when I was young, I used to mingle, and I used to hustle, right? So I gotta go on this gym floor and make myself the product, I gotta sell myself. I'm in shape, I know I can get clients, I just gotta get a few clients and get a transformation, right? And all the gym members are gonna see it. So get a client, got a transformation. Now other clients coming to me. Start talking to guys on the gym floor. I made it like the prison workout yard. Everybody knows all the guys that work out in prison. Mm -hmm. So it's like a community. So I put my mindset, okay, I'm still in prison, but I'm going to be respectful, friendly, just like prison, respect everything all around you, right? I'm doing that same mentality in the gym. And I'm gravitating to people, talking to them every day. I'm picking up all the weights and I'm holding conversation with guys. Hey, I'm going to let you train my wife. Got his wife results, they tell their friend, word of mouth, right? So I'm like, okay, now it's working for me. I already have experience in sales. Man, listen, not to glorify my past, you know what I mean, as a drug dealer, but you gotta have experience in sales. It's not as easy as people think it is, you know what I mean? So I end up starting closing packages, training packages. I end up breaking all the records that stood there at that gym since 1993. And the Forbes publisher reached out to me to shine light on my story and to shine light on Mr. Travis Duggar for giving a convicted felon an opportunity, right? So then that same news, 12 news, they featured me on the news there showing my redemption story. Remind you, seven years, no, four years, in 2015, they put me on the news for me getting sentenced to 20 years. So it was like, okay, now I'm changing the narrative of my story, right? But I went through that phase of being discouraged, but I persevered. And that perseverance, that seed planted from those guys that had life sentences, right? They pushed me. Before I left Memphis, Tennessee, right? The guy that I worked out with that had two years, I mean, two life sentences plus 10 years, he never talked to me outside of us working out. When we seen each other on the compound walking, he would just be like, what's up, youngster? The day he found out that I was leaving, I guess he had a bond with me from working out and pushing, he seen my mindset. We were in the barbershop, I'll never forget it. He's like, you know, look, I've seen several guys your age with short sentences, five to 10 years, come in here, get out and don't change. Put your plan together and execute your plan when you get out. Don't get out there freestyling and trying to put a plan together after you get out. And I took heed to that, right? That was like, a GPS for me and it was in the back of my mind when I arrived to my next prison 
in Miami and South Carolina. I was working on my plan. So when my story was featured in Forbes, and then after that, like, bro, I had 100 clients. And then when, pre, when pan, that was pre-pandemic. Pandemic hit, I had still had 50 clients coming. I was training like 20, 30 nurses. I was training people from all walks of life, CEOs, nurses, people that work at the oil, oil, oil refineries. And I met a lot of great guys that became my friends as well that invest in my company as well. But then after that, I ended up moving back to Florida. I met Lil Pump's manager, Lil Terrio. I ended up helping Lil Terrio lose over 100 pounds, was featured in TMZ with him, went on No Jumper with him. I ended up helping Lil Pump get his life together, got a transformation in a short amount of time. And it's hard to get a celebrity a transformation because you know their busy schedule. But um, every time he called me, and asked me, hey, Kip, can I eat this? I tell him, and you know, we got results. And beside, then I end up moving to LA to Calabasas. I came over here for my birthday and I stopped by George Foreman's gym. And I ended up talking to him. A few months later, he was looking for a weight loss specialist. So now I'm over there training. I got my one on one online coaching. And also, I created Streets to Fitness Youth Empowerment Organization. I go to juvenile detention centers and I talk to the youth. I tell them my story. I created a, a curriculum and a daily planner, a workout they can do while they're in there so they can work on their physical, mental, and um, spiritual and emotional health. You know what I mean? Like, I found an outlet through structure. In prison, when you create a routine, that takes discipline and consistency in order to get results. And to, to have discipline and consistency while in there, it's hard, it's not easy as people think it is. A lot of people that haven't been on the inside, they think, okay, you have nothing but time. There's guys that sit in front of the TV and just watch TV, sports betting, yeah. and eat. Yeah and, yeah, and and they're in a depression cave. Yeah, yeah. And the same as people that's free, they're in their own prison and depression cave. They commit time to Netflix, eat, 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 eat. Get off work, eat, eat, eat. And they don't realize they're, they're in an unhealthy, matrix depression cave mm -hmm. because they're, they're satisfying that emotional depression because they're becoming emotional eaters, right? I watch a lot of guys, bro. When people watch Love and Hip Hop and they sitting there eating belly like this, I'm working out, walking the top tier, 1,000 push-ups, 500 dips on the corner mm -hmm. of the, um, the tier because that's what, that was in South Carolina. They didn't have weights. Bro, I wasn't sitting in front of the TV just consuming content on TV. Mm -hmm. I was reading self-help books. I was reading the Bible. How can I change myself? I was asking in Miami, right, there was high-profile guys that were featured on American Greed. I would gravitate to them and ask them, hey, look, I'll tell them my story, and I will gain knowledge from them, have them mentor me, and I'll train them. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of stuff that I learned from them and the books that they gave me to read changed my life. So it was like, Mental, physical, and emotional structure. It was like one guy told me, he was like, how does the table stay stable? It has four legs. Humans have four legs as well, pillars. Mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. He was like, if one is off or two is off, you're unbalanced. Mm -hmm. That changed my mindset. And when I started dialing on all four, planted four seeds, and I watered all those seeds each and every day, I realized I changed. I realized I had grown and I've evolved to a different person from the six years that I did from 23 to 29. They let me out two weeks before I turned 30. Mm. Damn, man. That's yeah. a hell of a story, bro. Yeah. I mean, shit. That's, that's an inspiration to anybody that's a young person out there that is caught up in the drug life, you know, using drugs, um, selling drugs, or that doesn't really have any direction. You know, a lot of people, like you said, I used to see it all the time. I'd come from the law library because I just worked out and I, and I studied a lot. And I would come in and it'd be like three TVs on cops and everybody be sitting there eating a bowl of top ramen, like watching TV. I couldn't believe it. Like, damn, these Bro, dudes. Bro, I was addicted to the nacho bowls. I didn't get abs until I cut out the nacho bowls and the top Roman noodles. Yeah. And I condone uh, um, Cali Muscle. Right. He was glorifying that lifestyle yeah. that was in jail. But now he's shedding light on. Look, that's unhealthy. Yeah. Bro, yeah. my awareness level, like I used to watch guys when they did medical, all these guys, what they were eating. 
I'm like, man, I don't want to be in my 20s or 30s yeah. going to med call. I want to preserve myself. I used to watch what they eat. And now the people that's not, when they say med call that's not going, I'm watching what they're eating. Well, even even look on the street, though. Like you said, I mean, you got people out here on the street, man. I mean, I, I drive by, like, uh, some of the fast food. Dude, the line be outside on the street. Crazy. You know, people, and then people talking about they complain on oh, my health, and they want you to feel sorry for them. You're doing it to yourself. Right. You can't feel sorry for something you you're doing. Yourself. You're sabotaging yourself. So you got to have discipline. And that's one thing, you know, whenever I, I get in a dark place on the street, I go back to, like, okay, this ain't really that dark. I know some places where it's horrible. Right. You know, I'm dealing with some shit. So I reflect on that, not to brag on it, but to find strength to pull me out of places on the street because sometimes you 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 know, you look at this and people think, Oh, this is this ain't shit. This is this is this is opportunity, and it's all on how you look at your situation and what you do and what you what you make from it, what you do with it. And um, yeah, bro, you took it to another level, man. So you know, I, I think it's important that your message is out there. And that, you know, people, you know, look and see what you've done for yourself from somebody, dude, you, you, like you said, no male figure, you know, your mom, you know, not having a family support, you know, dude, that's a lot of stacks. And you're not sitting here crying victim. Right. You know what I mean? And that's one thing I'm about when I bring people on this platform is not crying victim because, like, I'm not sitting here. I'm three times fell. I spent over a decade of my life, but I'm not here Oh, the government, man. Oh, man. White supremacy. Oh, right. It's some bullshit. Right, it's it some is. straight bullshit. You know it what is. I mean? You can get out here and do whatever you want, and you're a perfect example. So um, I thank you, man, for coming on the platform, man, sharing your channel, you know, and sharing your, your information, giving people an opportunity to tap in with your social media. We're going to have all that in the links. And, uh, dude, you're, you're opening up eyes and showing that. If you can do it, you know, next man, what's his excuse? Right. No ain't excuse. No, ain't no excuse. No you excuse. You grew up, I and mean, what's your excuse for real? Right. You know what I mean? A lot of people, oh, man, it's rough out here. I know some dude. I said, dude, you ain't never been locked up. Right. You ain't never had handcuffs. You're, talking about, you're complaining about, oh, it's hard. What are you talking about? Bro, I was locked up in eight states. Eight states. Man, but, it's, it's, it's just a lot, of, it's a lot of weak people, a lot of entitled. A lot of people think that they got something coming, and they ain't got shit coming, man. Right. But, uh, you know. Your, your story, like I said, is going to change lives, and um, I'm glad we had the opportunity to get you on the show, bro, because uh, this thing going to go viral. Thanks for having me, bro. I appreciate you giving me your platform to share my story. Yeah, there you have it. Big Herc 916 getting down fresh out and kit. You tired of smelling like stinky butt, funky armpits? Wash your ass. Go to FreshOutStories.com and pick you up a bar of soap.